Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Brad Dyke saying hi. Well, yesterday, as I discussed, we brought up our primary storage platform in the house, which is very important because it carries a lot of our archival pictures and so on and so on. Now, the second part is we are deploying a true NAS model, a clean true NAS model with uh, adaptive storage added to it. So the very first things you've got to make sure you're doing is make sure your cables and connections are good. So in regards to cable and connections, I'm using a DDS style connection interface and it runs on what we call the full SAS connect connector here. This is a very long neck style interface, but the other end of my cable is a short mini, -na uh, mini SAS connection, which has a small groove in it and a shorter. So when you compare the two side by side, they're not quite the same. So here you have the mini SAS, sorry, that's the GBIC. You have a mini SAS connection here, which is the small one and it's grooved as you can see there. And it has uh, basically a clean cut snap-in kind of configuration, which pops right in. But on the other end, way down here in the back, as you're looking at the storage array here, this cable is a full-blown SAS connector. So when I pull that out, you'll see that it's a long, very long connector style interface. And the bridge cable, which is going from B channel here over to A channel over here, closes the loop so I can run a single cable feed with a failover loop in place. Now I've got my power requirements here. It's going to sound like a jet engine here in a minute as I bridge these two connections over and then give it power. Hang on a second. There's one. In Houston, we have liftoff. Yeah, that's pretty loud. But the good news is that even though it's loud, it will die out. This is called the CPU cycle post BIOS test. It tests the system to make sure the system is operational and has capacity. If the fans are all working at maximum output, and as you can see, very quickly does the, 20, the 2642 series or all of the DDS series prove that they run very quiet after their initial post. Now over here, we have our core chassis as well. And I'm giving it power now, and you should see, yep, there's an LED right there. See it lit up? And that LED right there will provide us the ability to confirm that we have power diagnostics in place. So I have a 10 gigabit connection here. No cable Cat5 at all. And I've got my SAS bridge cable in place. So with that, I'm at ready to point to test drives. So as you can see here, I have a series of drives all already posting now. Plus I have inactive drives over on the side that which are basically for future spares and growth. But this chassis here is going to be a series of drives that are basically running at, uh, let's see, these are 600s I believe. Yeah, 600s. So I've got basically a decent little archiver here, but it's a temporary archiver because as you look here, over here, I have the SSDs and they are quite powerful by themselves. So with that being said, as you can see, all these drives are posting at the bias level controller inside the disk array, but the server itself is not. The server is off, so I need to check these drives and remove them because I need a clean configuration build. And uh, that means basically in a nutshell, I don't want anything except for two disk drives to populate. That's it. So the rest of these blanks will be just staged in a clean configuration format and these aren't even populated with disks. So this is kind of giving you an indication of what we're dealing with here. On these particular guys are one terabyte drives. I, yeah, no, I'm sorry, these are 300 gig drives. 
Yeah, 300. Which is, should be sufficient for a true NAS boot. That's a one terabyte drive. That's an outstander. Not basically. This is a 100 gig SSD drive, which is a cache drive, which you'll want to use on the RAID controller for caching functionality. And uh, I'm removing these drives to take them out of the equation as well. And so what that's gonna leave me are two drives in the back end. Okay, so if you look back here, I have two hard drives, one here and one here. These two back-end hard drives will basically act as a boot drive, okay? So with that, you know, these are 600 gig drives. They're Hitachis, and they'll be able to post the system. Okay, so now I've got power up coming up now on the actual unit itself. Notice that I'm gonna get some alerts because I've depopulated areas. The airflow quality is a little jeopardized, but that's okay, don't worry about that. They will get populated once I know that my post process is good. So over here I am posting now and I'm gonna be going into the configuration of the controller to clean it up some. It needs a little TLC. It has previous configurations and I need to wipe them all clean, go back in and rebuild the SSD caching of the 100 gig uh, SSD drive. That makes the per controller work a lot more efficiently, especially when it comes to caching because we are going to use this unit for doing just that. So, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of the, what I call, pre-bloatware platforming. Uh, the reason why I'm not a big fan is because of the fact that it can be a little slow. Oops, I got a training failure on some memory. I'll have to check that out but it won't have any effect because I have ECC memory and it's redundant, 64 gigs. So that's 128 gigs and one pair, of an eight, eight gig of allocation has fallen off the side. So there are the post cycles for the SSD CCAs and that's good. They are coming up. I am seeing the TSA twos and I am seeing TS twos, the 93 gig up pump. So we'll let that post. Now those are boot drives inside the system. And we're going to wipe them clean. Now the reason why we're gonna wipe them clean is because these are SSD internal cards. Now this is the LSI side detecting all the disks out there at 500 gig capacities. So that's good. And uh, what we're gonna do here is once we remove our boot proms, and we can get to a bootable state, then we will work with the post configuration RAID controller to do what we need to do. And there it is, the, there is the RAID controller right there. And I can go ahead and hit that. This will take a little bit of time. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause out the video until we get to the proper menu. Okay, so now we are at the configuration control for the RAID controller. And I really want to dumb down the controller state right now. I'm going to take a look at the attributes that are out there. And right there is a physical disk. This is the physical disk 100 SSD SATA. And that's a fairly high performance disk that we don't want to use per se as a configuration set but we want to set them as priority set so with that being said uh, we also have two fast ssd bridge cards in the system as well and i'm thinking that i'm going to clear the configs on this setup here and by doing that i'm going to clear the attributes it looks like they have already been cleared let me go ahead and hit the cache cat Select and create. Okay, so I should now have my resource in play. All right, I've confirmed that it is configured. 
So if I go into virtual and I want it to create a virtual disk, I'm going to go in here and I can see my two options, which is basically only two physical disks are present. And I think what I will do as part of that process is I will remove those two disks just to make sure that they're not going to function. So stand by for just a second. Okay, so I have actually now removed the disks from functioning and I only show right there okay very good one 100 gig allocation disk and it is online and operational and it is part of the actual disk caching function so if I go into here uh, I can basically identify the only online that's there which is okay and I like what I'm seeing so at that point stage, I'm going to go into here, your disk groupings. I have one virtual zero cache CAD only. That's what you want. You see right there. Now that's going to be valuable when it comes to using uh, your high speed burst caching processes in writing data. Okay, so with this being the case, my next task is to go ahead and disconnect the disk array that is going to allow us to keep the system clean so stand by for a second I'm going to disconnect the SAS array okay now I've disconnected all of the hard drives except for the two SSD flash high performance burst cards that are sitting inside the environment now I'm going to go ahead and let this reboot and it's going to come up into a clean configuration and I'm going to put on my TrueNAS boot device so that I can start posting the operating system. So stand by for a minute while I go ahead and get that prepped. Okay, so you're probably asking the question, okay, why did I enable cache caching for a 100 gig SSD drive on the PERC controller side? Why the LSI SAS controller, which has nothing to do with the burst casting of the SSD side for the perk is out there and it's going to support the SAS model. Well the answer to that is remember that inside this particular 720 chassis resides a principal component. Now that component is basically um, the function that exists out there and it is going to give you the capacity to post what we call a dual SSD configuration. Now the two flashcards, that's high performance SSD series, Oracle, I think they're 400s. They each have 400 gigs on them, four 100 gig allocations each. And you can configure them in different formats that you want to do. Now with that, these are PCIe cards. So they have the SSDs built into the PCIe bus, which is slightly different than PCIe 4 or 3 communication busing. Uh, it's very high performance, and you want that to be the boot component, uh, and you want to build it into a redundancy model at the OS level, because unfortunately the cards are not RAID-based. They're not even HBA-based. They're straight, very similar to you'd have PCI onboard uh, busing, and that is a process that you have to kind of go through uh, using software RAID or HBA software like ZFS to pair them up to build some RAID 1 type of redundancy. So that's what I'm going to do here. I have two cards, two sets of SSD drives. Uh, I'll pair them up as the boot drive for TrueNAS. And at that point in stage, then I'll start, art, start adding, once I know I have a good, solid, up-to-date TrueNAS configuration, I will reboot the machine start putting the disks in proper sequences and allow them to post to do what I want them to do. So with that, stand by for a second. We are now going into the boot post mode. And if I built out my, my boot image, which will either be a showstopper or it will be just what it's going to be, uh, we will know pretty much exactly what we need to do. And as you noticed, there's not a single hard drive coming up under the LSI, uh, LSI controller. 
I like the LSIs because they're flexible. They have ease of work between SSDs and SATAs and SASs out there in mixed mode as well as isolated mode as long as you properly channel them in the actual disk arrays themselves. So what we're doing right now is we're getting through all of the different kind of controllers that I have on board so that I'll be able to post into the USB uh, boot post mo menu so I can pick a USB device to boot. And that would be and should be a working copy of, um, as we like to say, of a installable Linux image. <laughs> Only problem is Mint sometimes screws up images as I build them out, so it's kind of a pain in the butt, but it's okay. That's how we learn, right? Okay, so here we are. We're in the Dell Manager. We're going to the boot bias mode. It's going to flip over, and it's going to provide us an avenue for boot and post. Now, it is set for UEFI. Um, I will have to take a look at that possibly and flip it back to bias mode But let's let the config stand as is Okay, here we go normal USB flash drive selected and posting and we have Something But it doesn't look like it's the correct Post. Hello. There we go. All right. We're going to go with number one. Enter. Okay. So we're going to go through the boot process. And my hopeful goal is as I'm going through this process, I want my flashcards to be visible. Using those Oracle high speed cache buffer cards as SSD drives is really going to make this bad boy fly like a bat out of hell. As long as it's postable. If it's not postable, then I've got problems. Uh, doing a little bit of an adjustment there. Install. Okay. So I am seeing ATAs. And I am seeing them correctly. One, two, three, four. Right? One, two, three, four. Okay. These are four separate SSD drives. 100 gigs each. And I will eventually mirror this first one with the second one once TrueNAS is built and I compare it into redundancy. So we're going to select that guy right there. This is HBA mode, as far as you're concerned and I'm concerned. And uh, this is going to, of course, wipe out the uh, process. So I will go ahead and initiate a new config as well as a new password. Okay, so that's the baseline config. You just press enter all the way through. Don't do anything else. Just basically do what has to be done. And as you can notice right here, it just destroyed the configuration and recreated it in the clear. So that being done, uh, it was the only partition that was destroyed, and that's okay. Uh, we will build these out to be a little bit more flexible, but you really don't need a lot when it comes to working with Free, uh, true, true NAS or free NAS to get yourself into a good place performance wise. So I'm going to let this process roll through and it's going to come up and it's going to specify and I'll have to put in some specs and information like that and then I'll be able to start the process of testing logins and so on and so on. So stand by. Okay, one of the very important details I'm watching this build out you'll notice that my zero set cards, these are my four 100 gig allocation drives and then my secondary 100 gig four 100 gig drives are on different cards and they are identified here when you set your raid sets don't pair them on the same card pair this with the other card to give you your redundancy and pair four of the of the eight together in a raid one model so that you have functional redundancy you're not going to be able to do a hot swappable state unfortunately uh, the hot swappable is not applicable because this is on an onboard card so because of that, um, you need to understand that process. Okay, now TrueNAS is rebooting now. And at this point in stage, 
it's going to go through a lot of diagnostic states as its process. And that's perfectly okay because what's going to happen when that does that is it's going to post the state of what I only allow it to see. Now, um, why did I do that? Because it's easiest to stage your disk arrays in increments uh, opposed to you doing them pre-configs. Now, if you've got a vendor out there who will pre-config them for you, that's great. But the reality of the fact is we're poor guys and gals, so we can't do that. So as you look down here, I have popped the SAS controller interface out. Sorry for the terrible movement. But now I'm going to deinitiate the drives from the bus. By doing that, I'm going to clear the SAS controller's configuration of detectable devices. It matters, trust me. So, I'm going to go ahead and start deinitiating them. They're going off the bus now. The controller will eventually report zero value on the bus, which means that when the SAS controller is posted in the next time, it will be zeroed out and clean and ready to go. So you'll have no uh, inherited headaches coming from some other source. So with that being said, um, these disks down here will be able to provide us um, a very easy in sequential order process. And what I mean by that is when I'm ready to bring them online from up here and I've got the SAS controller is connected and it's ready to see disks, I'll be pushing one channel one bus in first and then channel two bus and channel three bus and channel 4 bus and the beauty of that is the fact that the system will synchronize the drive IDs correctly if I had just put all these disks in here and all these disks in here they do microsecondly wise some will come up faster than others so suddenly your your IDs are flying all over the place and your your disk assignments aren't coinciding that's the nice thing about NetApp or Dell EMC and so on, is they'll do this for you if you buy a brand new array. But if you're a poor guy and you buy one of these on eBay, you need to know how to sequentially bring in your drive IDs. So it's very easy to look at these numbers at the top and tag them to the drive IDs inside the controller. Um, sometimes it's difficult to find a failing drive and it's a real big plus. The three pars aren't so nice about this. They're a little bit more of a headache. Uh, they're okay though, they still function, and this is my son's uh, future disc array, so he'll be using this for his three boxes down here, his powerhouse and his two um, uh, one use. But right now I've staged the capacity for this and it's good to go as is right now. That's good. Now, um, I know I can run this array and my server, and I can run the power head, the head server, and its capacity down here side by side without any power impacts of any kind. That's because I've got 20 amps, 20 amps, 20 amps, 20 amps. Total of 80 amps that's providing power feed. Now that's not great. It's um, about a third of the house's power. So I have to be careful how much consumption I run through my circuits. And uh, so it, that's why I built this new lab this way so that I could bring just a small number of these guys up, run them in an inner test pace, uh, uh, pace platform environment, and then get them to work the way I want them. But over here, this is the only operate. I'm sorry, this and this are the only operational platforms on this side. Everything else will be going up to this managed switch here for my son's playground. So hold on a second here and we'll check the status of the boot and we'll see how it's going. Okay, so it looks like we are, um, we are in a problem with the boot manager. So I'm going to have to go into the boot manager and change to bias state from the U uh, UFID boot process. Yep, that's my problem. See it right there? And then I'll hit that value. And then we'll go ahead and move back and finished. Save the value, allow it to reboot again, and we are able to finish out and reboot. Alright, so give it a second. 
Okay, so we're now posting. There are the eight drives. And uh, my first one there, ATA193, is my boot post set. And that's the one that should hopefully boot into uh, TrueNAS. And if you start to hear the Dell 720's fans spark up, put the inserts back in and your server will calm down. When you don't have drive bays fully populated with blanks at a minimum, but you can use other platforms to, um, you know, like hard drives, SSD drives, caddy kind of setups, you got to make sure the bays are populated. That's an important detail. And a caddy is just nothing but a blank. In other words, uh, it either is a drive ready to mount caddy or it's a ventilation blank. And uh, I have that here. Uh, in this environment setup so that you can here I'll show you what it looks like while we wait for it to finish posting. You know these are blanks right here and they're just basically plastic. They have no value except for the fact that they balance airflow through these slots. These are drive readies. In other words they're ready to mount a drive but when you put them in like this they also balance airflow. So make sure that you do that. Alright so Coming back to our PROM boot. Now these new HDMI platform monitors don't like CLI very much. That's okay. I mean, it does work. It's just kind of a, a little bit of a pain in dealing with uh, how the system is able to post and set. So let's give it here a second and let it scan for BIOS boot, boot devices. I'm going to turn this light out. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, it is seeing the BIOS boot disks. And we want to boot. So this is a clean, clean configuration. And it is so clean that it really does boot fast. Now, when you have disks added to this equation, this posting process will hit every single disk drive and bring them up with the configuration specs so that they come in correctly and stage into their disk groups or pools, as we call them today, uh, so they're ready for their uh, volumes that would be created from the pools and assigned to protocols to allow you to share them out. This would be NFS, SMB, um, which is also Samba, re-emulation for Windows using, NF, uh, using um, NTFS. And uh, this process that you see here is it's going through and making sure everything is correct is eventually going to get to the point where it's going to say okay now I'm ready to post the bias when it posts finishes the back-end diagnostics it will then only then load the actual internet uh, valued uh, entries such as your IP address DNS and so on and so on this is only this is the only place where it gets complicated but not really if you know your infrastructure uh, and you know if you use 888888 and I'm sorry 8888 and 88.4.4, uh, those are two Google DNSs. You're set. You're good to go. Uh, the only thing that matters at this point in stage is uh, how it's going to post and do what you want to do. And as you can see, this is a very high-end machine, so it's it's just going through the installation configuration component like it's yesterday's news. It's very fast. I love that part. Uh, you should see the quad when the quad when the quad runs. It really is pretty awesome. Okay, so I think we are coming to the point where we can now um, get us to a point where we should be able to post. All right, it just checked the four one gig ports, seeing that they're all inactive. Uh, it does have one ten gig port. And uh, we will see how well it goes. Still posting. All right, so we're here now. This is the configuration menu for TrueNAS. It's very much like FreeNAS. I've built six FreeNAS platforms, two enterprise levels, and about five TrueNAS platforms, one enterprise level. There's nothing bad about them. It's just a process. We walk through these configurations and we set them up. So I'm going to do that right now and no I'm not going to share that information with you but I'll be right back. Hang on. 
Okay, so at this point in stage, I am good. So I'm initiating a reboot process now, and I am functional. So at this point in stage, I can then choose to log into the configuration by, by my other chassis. And again, this is gonna get a little noisy uh, because I'm running two DX20s, DX720s, correction, um, and uh, three disk arrays might get a little noisy, <laughs> just a little bit. So stand by while I bring those up. All right, so I've gotten past the noisy part and we're back to normal. And I am now posting the second 720 chassis, which is right down here. And it's posting over here, of course, the other one is operational, but there's only a single drive app running on that one. And the, all of the drives on the bottom are offline. So that's, that's okay. Let's, I'll walk you through that process in another video. But right now, for tonight, all we're doing is making sure the TrueNAS platform boots up, stay and is stable, and it is in good shape. And over here, as you can see, the platform is beginning to come up, and it will start doing some things. And I can eventually retire that bottom array and just run strictly on the SSD stuff. I can move these other drives over to archiving. That's why I'm not too excited about setting those up just yet. But uh, it's in the process of getting itself in a good place. So we're still posting, so stand by. Okay, so we are posting and we are coming up. We should have everything running here in just a second. Okay, so we are posting now. And as you can hear down here, I have plenty of noise because of the heat variances that are in play. And I've decided to go ahead and just let the lab run cool. Cooler, I should say, because of the fact these machines are in here. So, um, it's starting to step down, that's good. So, I am going to adjust the temperature just a little bit lower, take it to 66 degrees, so I'll balance out. But as you can hear, unlike the other one over there that doesn't have that many disks drives on it, this one is busy. So, we are here now. And uh, we are going to go ahead and do a login. And uh, of course, we want to make sure that we are able to hit the IP address of the TrueNAS and then eventually log into the TrueNAS itself. So I'm going to do that now. Give it a second. I'll run the test, test loops and resume the video in just a second. Okay, test loops are finished up and I am going to go ahead and uh, just do the baseline. Please feel free to wipe out your configs and start over, over and over and over because that makes you a better person and always say never to that crap. And uh, this gives you the ability of uh, just having good experience with the preset configs, learning how to play with the hardware to make it fit better, and so on and so on. So here is the initial boot process of, of TrueNAS 13.0-U3.1, which is right there. So we're going to initiate for updates, and we're going to start the process off here. And of course our system set failed, so that might mean that we have an issue going on here. So let me take a quick look and see what's going on. Okay, so we do apparently have an issue. So I can hit it internally, but I don't think it can, it can externally make its way out. So that's okay. That's just a process of 
making sure your DNS entries and values are correct might be an issue there. Uh, and I'll check that out. But this right now shows that we have gotten ourselves, surprisingly, rather quickly, uh, two set disk array platforms and a single disk array platform on two, on two Dell 720 chassis, one true NAS acting as a repository backup solution to my primary storage system, which will in, in turn will support uh, a variety of different enterprise style DevOps tools. Uh, so at this point in stage, I'm going to go ahead and bring this particular video to an end. Uh, the next part will be about bringing drives into the equation and walking it through those one, two, threes and getting uh, a comfort margin on the health of my drives and building up those disk pools that I will create and then start parsing out for my repository shares. Um, this is Brad Dyke signing off. You guys take care and look for my next video. Thank you.